let me begin with a very simple question. How many people in this room believe in the existence of unicorns? So probably, you know, as a sane modern person, you would say, well, you know, there really are no unicorns. I will argue today, in some detail, that there really are unicorns, but that the world does not exist. Okay, so I believe that the world does not exist, but I do believe that unicorns exist. Among other things, I believe that there are planets, numbers, governments, unfair elections, really democratic elections, law of vulnerability, and this event. So I think that all these things exist, but there's exactly one thing which really does not exist, namely the world. So all of this uh, hopefully sounds crazy, uh, uh, which gives me the chance to elaborate and show you what that really means and why I think that this has revolutionary consequences, not just for philosophy as a discipline, but for our overall way of looking at what we still call the world. Okay, so my talk bears the title, Why the World Does Not Exist, and I will more particularly talk about what the world is. I will talk about existence, and I will talk about not uh, why the world does not exist. I will not talk about why or does. Okay, so uh, um, <laughs> let's begin with the world. Okay, so there are these weird words that we constantly use in our everyday language, uh, also in science, and pretty much everywhere, in order to describe the impression that we are part of a really big thing. Okay, and then we have all these words to refer to this really big thing. Nature, reality, the universe, okay, the world. And all these terms, okay, or if you're, you know, slightly more spiritual, maybe you want to say God or being. And all these terms seem to refer to, like, the maximally big thing, the biggest thing, okay? Not just this planet. Imagine, imagine there's something which you might call Google Universe, okay? Hopefully, you know, that's the future of search, okay? And then at some point there will be Google Universe. So you can just zoom out and zoom out and zoom out. And what you see, if you maximally zoom out, okay, that's the world. That's the universe, and in this whole thing, or reality, and in this big thing, we are somewhere, okay? Somewhere in the Milky Way, a tiny part, not really important, some kind of ants in the big picture, okay? But I believe that there is no such thing as this picture. I think that the, the, the whole train of thought which I just presented is really an illusion, okay? The world is an illusion. Now, that really sounds like something Buddhist or, uh, or Indian, but it isn't. It's, uh, you will see it's exactly the opposite. So what is the world then really, okay? So philosophers have tried to clarify this for pretty much 2,500 years, and arguably the world, in that sense, has been invented at some point in history in what is now Turkey. Okay, so the, the philosophy didn't originate in, in the Western tradition in Greece, but in Turkey. Philosophy is a Turkish project. And uh, what happened, okay, at a particular coast uh, is that people thought, well, look, um, what does it even mean that we are around? Okay, so imagine at some point people were hunting and protecting themselves from wild animals, etc. They were interested, in what, they had a hard time even find, finding good food. Imagine the food that you had to have in the savanna, okay, or when we're still living in caves. I don't want to eat that, that's horrible, that's a bad time. Okay, so in that time people were really interested in just surviving. But at some point when survival was pretty much guaranteed, etc., okay, people were wondering, what does all of this mean? What's going on? Where am I? Okay. And the answer they gave is, well, I am in the world. Okay. And the world is this really big thing. And this, is, this triggered a huge process of civilization, which philosophers call metaphysics. Metaphysics is a philosophical discipline, and I define that discipline as the attempt okay, to develop a theory of the world as world, or a theory of absolutely everything. Okay, so what we now know is, so we're looking for this big theory of absolutely everything, the maximally fundamental theory. We really want to know what it is, okay? So if that's the spirit which drives you, the unification of physics or whatever, okay, then the world formula, okay, then you're a metaphysician. This is what you're doing, okay? And I believe that it's an illusion, okay? So the world is this maximally big thing, and how can we really characterize it? Uh, characterize that thing. So let me give you two very prominent definitions of the world that you can find throughout the history of philosophy and show you okay, how philosophers really operate when it comes to these things before we can see why there is no such thing 
as the world. Okay, so the first very prominent definition of the world, something that uh, might probably have passed your mind every once in a while, is that, well, the world is the totality of things. Say, the world is the totality of all spatial temporal things. Okay, the world is planets and trees and stars and people and friends and grass, okay, etc. That's the world, all these things. And if you add all these things together, okay, plus, of course, time, you know, things gone and things yet to come, then you have the world, the big thing, the totality of things. Well, here's a problem. You see two hands in front of you, and it's true of these two hands, okay, that there are two, that this hand is my left hand, that this hand is my right hand, that this hand is not called Peter, because it doesn't even have a name, okay? So all these things are true of these things, okay? So there are things, which are true of things, okay? And those things are what philosophers call facts. Facts are things which are true of things. Now, facts are really weird because they're not spatial-temporal, okay? Where in space-time is the fact, for instance, that the Earth is bigger than its moon, okay? The Earth being bigger than its moon is neither the Earth nor the moon, nor any other spatial-temporal thing. You cannot point to the fact of the Earth being bigger than the Moon and say, well, this is where it is. The Earth being bigger than the Moon is in Alaska, obviously. No, it's nowhere, okay? It concerns both the Earth and the Moon, but it's nowhere to be found, okay? Why? Because the ingredients of facts are not spatial-temporal things, but concepts. Facts consist of concepts, okay? And what are concepts? Well, concepts are something Okay, which can truly be set of something in such a way that you make explicit something's property. Okay? Now you want to know what is a property, all these concepts, so let me give you a few of them. So things, obviously, are what they are okay, by having certain properties. I am Marcus Gabriel means, for instance, that I'm currently wearing this suit, that, uh, that I grew up somewhere, okay, that I have a human body, etc. Okay? That's what I am. I have all these properties. Other things have other properties and are thereby distinguished from Marcus Gabriel. For instance, my chair is neither a human body nor uh, was he ever born by any human being. Okay? So chairs don't do these things. Okay? My chair is, I don't know, what's, what color is my chair? Blue, say. Okay? And I'm not blue, there's no sense in which I am blue. Okay? So things have their properties and concepts are exactly okay, uh, uh, what generally characterizes things. There's this co the concept of being green, and the concept of being green is shared by all green things. Okay, now you see that if you define the world as just this huge thing, this container of all spatial-temporally extended things, then you miss most, most of it. You miss all concepts, you miss all relations, you miss all facts. All the interesting things are gone if that's the world. For instance, what about the Federal Republic of Germany? Okay, is the Federal Republic of Germany identical with all spatial temporal things appearing within its, uh, uh, within its range? No, that's an absurd idea, okay? For instance, the institution of democracy is not a spatial temporal object. That's the weirdest thing to believe. It's not like, oh yeah, I've seen democracy, it looks like this, and then you paint it, it's, it's, it's kind of blue, it looks like a mountain, okay? Uh, democracy doesn't have any looks. Okay, that's why we make up all these images uh, of democracy. That's, we, that's why we need metaphors and myths in order to characterize it, precisely because it's not a spatial-temporal thing. So, now we know already that the world, okay, the big thing that we're looking for, cannot be the totality of spatial-temporally extended things. But weirdly enough, this is the most widespread and most common metaphysics of our time. Okay? This is what gives rise to the idea that ultimately, if you really want to know what's going on in this world, okay, then you have to ask unified physics. Well, physics isn't exactly unified yet, but say future physics, when everything's settled, then you know okay, everything. Then you have the world formula. That idea okay, assumes that the world is precisely the totality of these things. But that's not true, because they're concepts and facts and governments and elections, and they're not spatial-temporal. Now, what is the world then? Well, the best definition you can come up with is the world, okay, is the totality of facts. 
where that means that the world is all the truth, everything which is true. It is true that I'm right now here. It is true that the Earth is bigger than the Moon, okay? But now, in order to see where I'm heading, just ask yourself the question, imagine you write down a list, okay, of all these facts. Try it in your mind, okay? I give you 10 seconds. <laughs> write, write down everything which is true, okay? Munich is uh, south of Berlin. The Earth is bigger than the Moon. The Big Bang happened at some particular point in time when you can, if that's a legitimate way of talking, it kind of isn't, etc. okay? I have hair. You write all these things down, okay, on your list. Now, what you just did is you produced a new fact, namely the list. So you need an extra list, okay, to talk about that list. And what about the list that you just gave, the meta list, the list, okay, which talks about the list? Well, obviously, you need another list, okay? You cannot finish that. There's no way to write down a list with everything which is true, okay? It's, it's impossible in principle. There's no such list. But if there's no such list, then the world does not exist, okay? That's one of the arguments that I use. There are more of them, okay? Because the world would precisely be the biggest thing. The world does not exist in just the same way in which there's no such thing as the biggest natural number. You don't understand what a natural number is if you think there's the biggest one. It's like, yeah, I can count to a thousand. Probably the next one is the biggest one, okay? No, there's a thousand and one and two, etc. You will never finish that, okay? And the same holds for the world. And that entails immediately that we have to reconsider what we even mean by existence, okay? We just heard that, you know, some people believe that to exist or that if, not, uh, uh, that if something isn't measurable, then it doesn't exist, okay? So that's a definition of existence. To exist is to be measurable. To exist is to have a certain number, okay? To exist is to have a quantity. And I think that's also utterly confused, okay? Uh, uh, for instance, um, you know, uh, that's a very standard example that philosophers use in order to refuse this idea, okay? So just ask yourself the question, how many bald people are in this room? Okay, there should be a number for that, okay, how many bald people are in this room? But now you have a problem with this concept bald, because if you're going to a Yul Brynner lookalike context, okay, there will hardly be any bald people in this room because Yul Brynner is absolutely bald, okay, no hair. But if you go to a Larry David lookalike context, okay, then a lot of people will be bald. So the concept of bald is such that it's not completely settled how many people fall under it. So we use a lot of concepts like bald or love, okay, and friendship and hate and justice, which aren't settled. We have no idea what they apply to. We are constantly negotiating the limits of these concepts. And all these things that we are applying these concepts to nevertheless exist. So existence has nothing really to do with numbers, okay, or discrete entities uh, uh, somewhere spread out in space and time. Existence is something else. So what is existence then, okay? Now here's a deep philosophical question, what is existence? So, and I think here's what existence is, okay? I think existence is the fact that something appears in, say, a context. I have my own word for that. I call these contexts fields of sense, but that doesn't really matter. Okay, so to exist is to appear in a context. And now you can see why there are unicorns, okay? We all know, hopefully, the movie The Last Unicorn, okay? Now, there obviously is a unicorn in the movie The Last Unicorn. Any interpretation according to which there are no unicorns in The Last Unicorn is a very contentious interpretation. I mean, you might come up with the idea that the movie is really about a pony which dresses, <laughs> which pretends to be a unicorn in order to cheat the people into believing that it's a unicorn, okay? But there's no evidence for that interpretation, okay? Also, it would be incredibly disappointing for all the young, beautiful daughters on this planet that this is an evil pony dressing up like a unicorn, okay? So that's a bad interpretation. The same holds for things like witches, okay? It's a very bad interpretation of, uh, of the tragedy Faust or of Macbeth, okay, according to which there are no witches in these tragedies. Obviously, there are witches, or Blair Witch Project. I mean, that's more contentious. People have argued that there is no witch in Blair Witch Project. But okay, in my interpretation, there is one. So if existence means to appear in a context, then you can fully legitimately say and understand why we say things such as there is a number a natural number, or exactly one natural number between three and five, namely four. Or there are witches. For instance, in Macbeth, there are trolls. 
okay, for instance, in some other movie, but not in Norway, okay? So uh, uh, there are witches, well, in Macbeth, but not in Spain or in any other country. There have never been any witches in any country, okay? But there have been witches in literature, for instance. So for something to exist is really for it to be part of a context. And that means that we have to give up the idea that there is something like an all-encompassing context, okay, which settles all matters of existence once and for all, in such a way that we are always entitled to not look into the details. Because I think that the concept of the world, or reality, or the universe, really serves a particular function. It's a fear concept, I think. It's the concept, okay, which gets, uh, gets rid of the actual infinity of things. Okay? Because what we are really confronted with, I wanted to demonstrate that with this example of the list, is an actual infinity of facts. Okay? So if I were to describe reality, if I, if I were able to give you another worldview, which I'm not because I'm claiming that there are no coherent worldviews here, okay? neither any religious worldview nor the scientific worldview for that matter, no worldview works. They're all false. They're all expressions of fear. You want to make things much simpler than they really are. And this is why you look for some formula covering everything. Everything is spatial-temporal. Okay? Uh, things are exactly like physics say they are. Uh, okay? or, fi or things are exactly like sociology says they are. Okay? Whatever your preferred discipline or way of thinking. Or uh, things are exactly like the Bible says. Okay? So whenever you use something like that, what you're really giving voice to is fear. Okay? Namely the fear of infinity. You're not looking into how things really are. And if I were to give you a world picture, okay, again, I could only give you a metaphor in order to show you how I believe things look once you give up the fantasy of the world. Okay? So here's how things look once the world's gone. Think of it this way. In this very moment, all our lives intersect, and they all intersect with a with an TEDx event. Okay? People watching this intersect currently with our lives, and all these things intersect in manifold ways. And if you really want to find out how they intersect, you have to talk to the people, you have to do particular research on how people interpret what I'm saying, etc. All these things intersect. While I'm, while I'm saying this, my neurons are firing, your neurons are firing, okay? Uh, some volcano is exploding in a galaxy far away and will never be observed, etc. All these detailed things are happening right now. Maybe a really crazy Martian creature is writing a book by the title, Why the World Really Does Exist, okay? Or another version of the Bible. They call it the Schmeibel over there, okay? So all of this is really happening, and I think what we need to do now, okay, and I think that's, that's an important step for humanity, is we really have to give up the idea that all things are connected. Some things are connected, and some things are not. We have to give up the idea that there's an overall structure which already settles things. And if we give up the idea, we also have a chance of reconsidering the option that we're really the free, autonomous human beings that we think we are. We are not determined by an overall structure okay, behind our backs. It's neither God nor the universe, okay? it's us. And that means, in that sense, we are alone. But the way we are alone is we are alone with infinite possibilities worth exploring. And this is how I want to end this talk. Thank you very much for your attention.